geez, oh, what a, he was the maestro, what a, couldn't have get, could not get near him. He loved around the corner, geez it back, you couldn't get the ball off him in a phone box. Join us for part one of our interview with former defender John Hughes as we look at Celtic in 2024 and we have a look back on his management career and coming up against Celtic. This is the official Celtic FC podcast. Yes, everyone. Hello, welcome along to the official Celtic FC podcast. I'm your host for this one, Ryan Marr, and I'm delighted to say I've got Matt Campbell alongside us. Matt, I'm really looking forward to this one. I know you are. Buzzing. Absolutely buzzing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, we've got a, a wonderful guest. Such a wonderful character and personality. Can't wait to get into the... the st- we've already started, to be fair, before I know. we've even uh, came on recording. Started with some of the stories, so um, aye, looking forward to this one. Yes, the <coughs> man we've got alongside us, who if you're watching, you'll be able to see right now. We've got a former Celtic defender, and I think one of Scottish football's biggest personalities as well. Uh, a man that played in the hoops between 1995 and 1996, and we were just talking there about your most famous moment, that goal at Ivory with your head um, to get a 1-1 draw in the derby but of course known in Scottish football for, for so much more than just your time at Celtic from your, your playing days at Falkirk and Hibs managing both clubs as well and of course a great success at Inverness Caledonian so there's so much that we're going to get into here none other than John Yogi Hughes joins us in the podcast John thank you so much yeah it's a pleasure being here always nice to come back to Parkhead uh, you always made to feel welcome so it's a pleasure being here yeah I mean what is it like coming back now because it's it's been a while since your, your playing days here but we were talking off camera you were here on Sunday for the game against Bucky but this place must hold so many amazing memories for you as a player and I know you were a fan when you were growing up as well yep that's correct uh, when I was a young kid that my father was a mad Celtic supporter uh, so growing up up to the age of 15 uh, Celtic was my team I uh, used to come through on the Leaf supporters bus, uh, through and stood in the jungle uh, and watch them. But then, because the 15th for 15 to 16, we started playing on a Saturday in the juveniles where I played, so I couldn't get through to Celtic. So used to play the game and then used to go up to Easter Road. Yeah. And that's roughly where I sort of changed my allegiance a little bit, but still got massive, massive uh, love for, for uh, Celtic. Yeah, definitely. And what are you, what are you up to these days, John? You look like you're still keeping yourself fit, anyway. But what's uh, what's John Hughes' his life looking like right now? No, no, I keep myself fit. I'm playing a lot of golf at the moment. Uh, I'm desperate to get back into the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think that I've still got something to offer the game. I've had good good success as a coach and a manager. I enjoy it. I enjoy being in a dressing room, coaching, trying to get the best out of them. Um, and a lot of stuff that I sort of try and do. With my team in terms of style of play, was a lot of stuff that I picked up at Celtic under Tommy Burns. So I try to get back into the game. It's not as easy as you think uh, because you've got that sort of a good CV. Uh, I totally understand that, but I don't let it get to me. You know, I've still got a life to lead, so keep myself fit. And if it's no golf, if it's cycling. If it's no cycling, it's in the gym and keep ticking over. And one thing about not being in the football, you get a chance to see your family grow up. And uh, my granddad now, my oldest daughter's got the young daughter, um, one and a half. And um, the twins, one of them's got a way over. She's working over in Dubai in the Emirates. And another one, we've only got one left in the house. So you get to see them grow up. It's good and spend time with them. So, And you have to appreciate that. I've seen so many managers be it 24-7. And that's what it takes, mm. trust me. When you go into the football game, it's... It's 24-7, you're at it. Um, and at times you miss that family. So, And you have to appreciate it. So I've done that, but the, the still, football's yeah. in you. Football's in you. And, uh, <laughs> the no matter what. Away. I've got a real obsessive uh, character and personality. And if it's... We were just talking before we come on. If it's not, not football... Uh, it's cycling, I and mean, it's cycling. I think I'm going to be in the Tour de France, and, <laughs> and I do hundreds of miles a week. And if it's no cycling, I'm, it was the gym. I was saying there uh, when I played at Celtic, I played at about fourteen stone two. I'm thirteen stone ten right at this moment in time, so I'm <laughs> lighter. But I went in for it. Yeah. And, you know, I went in for the the, the fitness stuff and the gym work and the, the heavy squats to keep strong and explosive and all that stuff. I really went for it. So, and even then, when I went 
when I was out the game, I was in the gym. I was doing. I went. I took it up to sixteen stone. Wow. Six meals a day, training <laughs> twice a day, five days a week, all that stuff, and that's how obsessive I was. And then now I'm in, into the golf. <laughs> I think I'm going to turn professional. And I've got the worst golf swing you've ever seen in your life. So, it's, 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 it's new year now. Everybody's trying to get of course, fit and yeah. get back into shape and stuff. Like, I certainly have been trying it up at the last couple of weeks, but I totally. You see with the cycling, I totally understand that because a couple of years ago, um, I just got right into it. I got right into cycling. I c- could not get enough of it. Got the road bike and I was, you know, Hamilton to Loch Lomond and back like, you know, yeah. three, four times a week. Got up to Dunoon and stuff like that. In fact, you know, one of the, we went, to, I went to Glen Buck as well uh, one day and Glen Buck famously. Shankly. Yes, absolutely. It's where Bill Shankly was um, ah, born right. and, and, and raised. It's, it's, there's nothing there. It's an abandoned mining sort of village now. Wow. But there's a lovely wee memorial to Bill Shankly. But just as an example, you know, the cycling just... Because there's a sense of adventure of it. Do you know what I mean? There's a... There's a freedom. Uh, totally there's a it. freedom There's a, when you're on that bike and you... You ever been driving and you've drove four or five miles, you say, how did I get here? <laughs> Your mind's... That's what happens on the bike. Mm-hmm. And if it's, if it's not... Then you know it's really difficult. But if you let your mind go, you're you're off, and away you go. And mm-hmm. many a time I've seen myself just cycling away, just start laughing, just <laughs> thinking back of your football days, and it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I can see a wee cycling Joe between you two. I think we should do it. Uh, I think uh, we no, should well, start well, a, a, a cycling I d- uh, show. Uh, well, I know. Well, sometimes it's just about putting the lycra on as well. It's not about the bike. Sometimes <laughs> you just put the lycra on just to walk about the house. Nah, I'm sorry, I don't want to see you in the lycra. I'm, I'm apologising. <laughs> I think I'm fantastic. I've got, like, I've got an image in my head now, and I'm uh, wanting to deviate from no, that. If we can get back to football well, now, if I, if I was to if I was to stick the lycra on, right now I'd look like a, a Scottish breakfast pack. So I'll give it a couple of months till I'm in this man's shape, and then I'll get. In I it. done it when I went up to Inverness when I, when I was manager at Inverness. I was always into the cycling, but I stayed in the Black Isle, which was about twenty odd to twenty five mile. Out in Vanessa, Aye. I just used to cycle in, cycle in and cycle home. It's so good. It's Every day. brilliant for you. It's so just... Keeps you fit. You're nah. inspiring me. You're inspiring I've never got into the like cycling, so I'm more into my running. But I kind of get that similar feeling when you're running as well. Yeah. Or sometimes Aye. your mind just goes. But uh, if, if you're going off for a wee cycle, maybe come and try and you join you. you watch us, we well, get a like. Will you see it? <laughs> well, hold it one minute, because I've not been on the bike for a couple of months. <laughs> it's, been a, it's been away for Christmas. <laughs> Well, other than the uh, cycling chat, we've got plenty of other things to get on with in, in the podcast. What we're actually going to do with this podcast, we're going to split it up into two parts because, John, there's plenty to get into with, with your career, Celtic and otherwise as well. So what we're going to do in the first part, which we're on just now, is we're going to have a little bit of a, a debrief about Celtic at the moment, under mm-hmm. Brendan, etc. Look a bit in your playing and management career, but not in Celtic. And we'll leave that for part two. Mm-hmm. And also in part two, we're going to get you to pick your 1-11 to 11 of Celtic uh, players. So that's going to be very exciting but why don't we start off with the match on Sunday Bucky Thistle in the Scottish Cup 5-0 victory um, it was the first game back after the winter break mm-hmm. as well so I think everybody was really really excited just to see Celtic yeah. back in action John I know you were here um, as well it must be difficult though when you're a manager coming up against a team like Bucky because you know you're just expected to win and win heavily as well so it's kind of a, a lose-lose situation at times with, with a, a fixture like that but what did you make of the, the game for Celtic? Well it was always uh, it was always going to be like that first and foremost I felt that Brendan picking a real strong team you know he showed his intent in terms of um, and the respect for Bucky and then Celtic went about their business. They were, I was listening to the interview. He was talking about getting, keeping the rhythm that they got for the last four games before yeah. the break and the speed in which they play. And the speed in which Celtic play, the give and goes round the corners, the link up play, the combination. And actually, something came up on YouTube after the game on the Sunday. And it come up Celtic goal, Celtic like Barcelona, it says. Yeah. And some of the goals, some of the link up play, and you're saying to yourself, yeah, I, albeit they're playing against Bucky. But I've seen Celtic a few times this year. I've seen them. Livingston, uh, when Joe Hart got sent off yep. and they went down to 10 men, they managed that game, they were super. Yeah, they were up and on a tricky, tricky surface, you know, that AstroTurf can be very, very difficult and they managed the game really well. Celtic's a right good side and then if we go back to Brendan, um, I understand one or two of the supporters why they feel a little bit aggrieved at Brendan, but surely if you're a true Celtic supporter, you're wanting the best for the club and the greater good of the club. 
And there's no better man to take over Celtic mm. than Brendan Rodgers. He, he, he's, he's an elite football manager in Britain. Elite football manager. Why would you not want that at your club? And the way he coaches, the way he gets his team to play, and um, that's, that's the Celtic way. That's the way I got brought up when I was here. I come in here as basically as a as a street fighter, you know, <laughs> wear the heart on his sleeve, get stuck in. For folk, I loved every minute. I come in here and it was like, whoa. <laughs> You know, and it was like the standards and the way you had to pass the ball, and and that's no different. Watching watching that Celtic team's no different. Absolutely fantastic. Five different goal scorers. Yep. Well, what more can you ask for? Yeah, and it was a, a great day really for you know for Bucky Matt. Yeah. Um, you saw the the crowd that they brought with them, which I think hats off to them. That's that's such an impressive thing to do because I think there's only really ten thousand people in the town village uh, where Bucky may be, and they brought I think over three thousand fans or something, was fu- which was uh, amazing. It was brilliant. I mean, you know, it's always great. Obviously, get a, a good away support. You know, earlier in the season, for example, I know there's a lot of your supporters who are still raving about the final support who ca- that came here. And um, you know, packed at that corner of the stadium, the Bucky Thistle fans came in their numbers as well. Similar numbers, mm. and you know, it does. This may come across as patronising, but it's not meant to be. But it's a wonderful day out for for the Bucky Thistle yeah. supporters because they're coming to one of the elite clubs in Europe. They're coming to one of the finest stadiums in football, and they're getting to see their team coming up against, as John said, a really strong. Celtic side which when I seen the team line on, on Sunday I was quite happy to see that love the Scottish Cup yeah. the, the club loves the Scottish Cup we're 41 time, times winners of the trophy we're the most successful club in the history of the tournament so get us kicked off to a good start in that tournament but what I was um, really delighted with on Sunday watching it was you know when Rocco Vata and Daniel Kelly getting involved in the game and obviously Rocco gets his gets his yeah, goal brilliant. as well. It's great to see that because you know it's such a strong lineup that we that we begin with, and then you're getting to see some of the youth coming in as well. So I think it was a, a really good day all round. And then obviously, you know, Sunday night the draw, and we get uh, St. Yeah, Mirren away. Yeah, we get St. Mirren away exactly. But yeah, the Scottish Cup is such a brilliant competition, John. I mean, you've got your own memories of it as a player, as a manager, of course. Inverness uh, comes to mind, but. You know, did you ever have any of those moments just thinking of Bucky coming to Celtic Park and the potential of a, of a shock? Did you ever have that as a manager or player when you went to? They are the hard ones. And um, I can remember the year we won it with Inverness. Uh, we were getting beat 1 0 at St. Murn. Um, and it wasn't long to go. And I, I actually turned around and I said, just we'll take a draw and get them back up the road. Mm-hmm. Take a draw. We got the goal. And we took them back up the road. I was a little bit surprised. Tommy Craig was the manager at the time and yeah. they agreed to come up on the wedding day. That was on a Saturday, come straight back up. Usually you get the option. And we were sort of saying that was one of the moments. Just Because I knew if we got the goal uh, and get them in a replay, I think we beat them 4 or 5 now in the replay. Oh, wow. um, and we really, you know, we, we thought, uh, honestly, we thought they would sort of take that. But they come right back up, played us. We were ready for it. And that was it. And you, you, you need a little bit of luck along the way. It's, I know we're not talking the, about the Celtic, you know, but yeah. when we played Celtic with Inverness, the luck that we carried in that semi final. <laughs> Unbelievable. Still but then you're sitting there so oh, it's, still, it's still raw now. I, I, actually, I actually got a letter from a Celtic supporter when I was managing Inverness after that. Uh, accusing us of everything and saying and for that I'll never be going back to a game and I'm saying I cannot work that out yeah. <laughs> he's a Celtic supporter why is he not want to go I, back and watch Celtic I regret sending that letter now if I'm being honest <laughs> <right. laughs> I'm yeah. over it now <laughs> but, but, you know that's the thing on cup competitions I know you're talking about the luck you need maybe being in Inverness Celtic you're expected to go and, and lift the trophy or at least get to the final every season but in one-off cup games and we've got St Mirren next mm. away from home in one-off cup games Anything can happen, can't it, John? Well, was it was it last year? It's St. Man beat Celtic. At, it's at St. Man, isn't it? I think uh, it last, it last, last yeah, season in league. Started yeah, last yeah, season, right. So St. Man's are not a bad side. Uh, they're going well, um, but I just feel there's a we- you just feel you get the sense of Celtic want to do the double. Having you know, sometimes you have to take the knocks. You want you want to do the, the treble. You always want to do it if, it if it's there for doing. You always want to do it. But for getting knocked out from Kilmarnock in the League Cup, I've just got a sneaky feeling that that's really mm. 
strength and the mentality in that dressing room to say, right, come on then, let's go, let's make sure they do the double. Yeah, and in recent the recent months, um, the last four games before the winter break, we really seem to, yeah. to kick on again, Matt, and we've come back, defeated Bucky Thistle, we've got Ross County this weekend, John, a club you know really well, but you do get the sense of what John's saying there, that the team seem to really be motoring on at this yeah. period in time, and usually after the winter break, you get that from Celtic, don't you? Yeah, no, absolutely. It was almost, we spoke about this, you know, the winter break, when it came, it was, it was almost annoying because you're thinking, we, we are, we have got momentum yeah. here and we're building. We obviously went, we went to Paisley, we went to St Mirren and you know, we won nil up within a minute. You know, we were 2 nil up within six minutes. Yeah. You know, that that was where we were. So to then come back and score five goals, you know, like, like you say, we're just building. It just feels like we're, we're constantly, constantly progressing. I agree with what, what, what you're saying. I think the exit in the League Cup early in the season, you know, you, that can... It's sore, it's annoying, but it's cup football and that happens, you know, it's 90 minutes and anybody, you know, if somebody has a good day and you have a bad day, then they're through, but you can use it, you know, to to, uh, to your advantage and I think that we have used it to our advantage. St Martin away in the cup though, you know how in cup competitions I would think you can categorise draws, you can <laughs> say, oh, it's a blockbuster draw and you know what that would be, it'd be a derby here or, or, yeah. or away from home, you'd have the potential banana skin which maybe... Bucky, you know, or if we'd have drawn like maybe maybe Bonnie Rig Rose or something, mm. you'd go, Oh, you know, potential for a banana skin there. I would put this firmly in the tricky cup tie category. This is a tricky one. Because St. Myrna fancy that. It's at home for them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's in the cup. They they're going they're going good guns this season as well. They're fifth just now. Yep. They'll be looking up the table. They're only I think two points behind Kilmarnock in fourth. So they're a decent side. I think it'll be a it'll be a tough, tricky cup tie, but of course I fancy us. Yeah, and John, when you're a manager as well, when you play games in the league compared to the cup, or sorry, when you play games in the cup compared to the league, do you have a little bit more of a sense of freedom when you're going up against a Celtic side? Yeah, yeah, you've got nothing to lose, certainly. Uh, you, you, you you go and have a go. Um, and if you're going to win the cup, when you're you're going to have to beat either Celtic or Rangers. Mm. That, if you want to win it, and that's usually the norm. Um and that's what you have to do, you know, but it, everybody says it's a free hit. I don't agree with that. Nothing's a free hit. You you owe it to your team and your, you owe it to your players and you owe it to your club to be totally out there organised. Uh, and you don't have to go gun ho you know, if you can nip them and beat them. I can remember even when we, when Celtic, Celtic were down to 10 men, when we played them in the semi-final. I can remember clearly uh, today, I just got them all in, made sure all my players were in nice and tight. And I just looked them all in the eye because all our work was done on the training pitch. We were our standards that we done day in day out on the training pitch was, you know, you're talking about guys like Graham Shinney, Tanzies, and Ryan Christie's course, real yeah. good guys like Gary Warren, real good professionals that wanted to set a standard. And I just looked at him and says, "You've never got a better chance, boys. Never got a better chance. Go and take it. Go and, go and be aggressive and go and take it." And they never let me down, you know. Mm. Um, and it was hard because Celtic didn't have 10 men. Craig, obviously, Craig Gordon getting sent off. You're saying to yourself, Lady Luck just might be on our side. Yeah. Uh, and it certainly was that day. I'll, yeah. I'll put my hand up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> There's another hand that was up. But you want to know something? See, your question, your question. There's a wee bit <laughs> caveat to that because your question, as you say, you're, you're playing Celtic and everybody expects Celtic to win. And you, so great. So there's no real pressure. You can go and play your game. Mm-hmm. See, when we, we won it and we went to the final, we got Falkirk. Now the pressure's on us. So mm. that, you sort of say, I've really felt as a coach and a manager, whoa, the pressure's on us now. Yeah. You know, Falkirk's now got nothing to lose. They're playing, they're in the league below us. And I had to handle that as a coach and a manager and say, right, how do I handle this? Uh, what mentality am I trying to get into the players? But as I say... It's no on the day. It's for the minute you walk in the door. It's the minute you walk in the door, how you, as a coach and manager, conduct yourself, what you want out of your players, your style of play, your philosophy, your vision for the club. And you tell the players, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm all about. And get on the bus because this is the way I'm going. And mm. I've never been one as a coach or a manager to be in it for the money. I'm in it for the love of the game. Mm-hmm. So I feel that frees me up to be to go and have a go and play a style of football. And a lot of the stuff, may I add, that I picked up at Celtic off of Tommy Burns. Yeah. It's such a f- 
And it frees me up to go and coach. I'm yeah. not, it frees me up. I'm no bothered. I'm, there are many a times I've come home at night and the wife's, oh, they've got beaten. You know, I've walked in, she says, you're all right for getting beat. Says, Boys are a different class today. Don't mm. mind getting beat, playing the style, style of play that I want to play. And going back to the Scottish Cup as well, don't forget, I took Falkirk into the Scottish yeah, Cup. Yeah, of course, 2009. Against... Against Rangers, yeah, we battered them that day. Yeah. We absolutely footballed them off the pitch that day. Now, many a time I bumped into uh, ex Rangers players and say, oh, "It's all about the result." I get that. I take my hat off to that, and the cup goes back to to Ibrox. But just going back to what I'm saying, sometimes it's about the performance, and our performance that day was very, very good. Rangers, you know, they were struggling. They mm. were struggling, but. They know how to get it done. Yeah, yeah. Matt, you wanted to come in there? No, right? it's just such a good... It's, it's The mindset is fantastic and it reminds me of... I think it might be Bertie all that maybe say that... You're talking about the work that happens through the week, you know, in the, on the training pitch and I'm sure it was Bertie who had the quote that they work hard all week and they get the day off on the Saturday to play, you know, <laughs> well, and that's the sort of I'll jump on on that. Honestly, I found the training... I know we're maybe jumping ahead of myself here. I found the training at Celtic harder in the games yeah, and that's no being disrespectful to anybody the games were difficult mm-hmm. but the training the way and the standard and the way we trained young v old <laughs> difficult. unbelievable I have really struggled when I first come here and I come in at, I never come at a young boy I come yeah. at a 31 year old sort of senior pro at Captain Falkirk and played with a lot a lot of good footballers so yeah. but when I come come here and it wasn't much different for what we done at Falkirk in terms of but the standard and the tempo and the pace and the quality of football player was... Yeah, but you've got 20, 23 guys in training, mm. most of them international as well, who are all wanting to fight for that jersey. So I imagine that's probably what it's like now. You, you, you're you in dressing rooms, John, more than, more than we are. Yep. But at Celtic at this moment in time, you talk about the standards in training, having that feeling of they want to go for the double. You've got guys like Carl McGregor in that changing room as captain. He'll be leading that, yeah. you know. I'm sure at this moment in time it'll be the same at Celtic as it was in your time. Yep, definitely. You, you come in here, as I was saying, when I first come um, the heart, Paul McStay, um, obviously you played against him for a number of years and you know the quality, but he was injured when I first come. And Brian Scott, the physio, showed me a bone that come up his ankle with a grafty bone. And you're saying to yourself, wow. But then when he come back in the training pitch, you went, jeez, oh, what the, he was a maestro, what the, <laughs> couldn't have get, could not get near him. He loved around the corner, gives it back. You couldn't get the ball off him in a phone box. <laughs> so that's the standard, the footballer. And I was saying that most of the, a lot of our training was uh, the Toros, you know, 6v2s and all that. I was never out of the middle. Never, ever out of the middle. <laughs> the tempo, I just kept giving the ball. I was not up to the Good speed. Doggies. Constantly, 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 never out of the middle. And the tempo and the speed, the one touch, two touch, below head tight, Toros, it was rapid, it was like pinball. Yeah. And then you would think, well, and that, then you would move that into a possession, you know, the possession would go into a, a small sided game. And then come a Saturday, it would be all shot, quick, pass and move around the corners. And it was it was just a pleasure to play because many a time, trust me, I've been on the other side where you're getting a run around and you're chasing <laughs> the ball and it's no nice. So to put the hoops on yeah. and nine times out of ten, you know, gear opposition, that kind of run around, it's, it's very enjoyable. Ah, you've done something that we all wish we'd done. And Absolutely. Talking about fast attacking football, it leads us nicely just on to a bit more about Brendan, John, because I'm, I'm interested to know your thoughts on it. You mentioned it earlier on about him being an elite manager and being here at Celtic and... What have you made, though, of Celtic so far this season under Brendan? Because is it eight points clear at the moment, Matt? Uh, yes. In the uh, Rangers got a few in hand. A couple, uh, couple, couple of games of in game, hand, yeah. yeah. But we've got that lead. I think, you know, we had a little bit of a blip in December time, quite clearly. We came off the back of that and really motored on and then kind of accumulated in that derby victory at the end of December time, which was just an amazing day here at Celtic Park. And I think it, it went to show just where we're at at this moment, that when it comes to those big games... Brendan knows how to get it done. He knows how to get it done. He knows how to win a football match. Um, but as I say, Brendan, the, the standard will be in there. We're, we're talking about guys like uh, Callum McGregor. Mm. You know, he'll have... How much you're watching with, him, with, yeah. With Scott Brown. Oh, what a footballer. I remember his starting off when he was away on loan at Notts County. That's right, yeah. Because I was just starting to sort of go into management and you're looking about what can we... It just shows you, he would get in any top six English Premier 
Yeah. Shot clubs. He never gives the ball away. See, when you talk to, no disrespect, you talk to the average football punter, they don't understand how hard it is just to control it, pass it, gives it back, control it. They think, well, well, that... No. no, I'm talking about control it so it's, it's, it's no going away for you. I'm talking about passing it. With a, with a tempo and a pass of a pace and a roll of the ball where even if opponents, that pass is turned you away from the opponent. And that's what Callum does all the time. Mm. You think he's got eyes in the back of his head. <laughs> and the team, I just think Brendan is a man for a job. I wish him all the best. I love watching his team play. Even there on Saturday against Bucky, I was trying to work it out and I don't know if he, was, if he meant to do that. But the way it worked out was he had two centre-halves playing against one. Bucky had four across midfield. Brendan had the three in midfield, but the two full backs joining in, so it's five. So the the wider ones in the midfield, the Bucky had to match the full backs. Celtic full backs are playing as wingers. <laughs> no. So that gives them a 3v2 in midfield against Bucky's two in midfield. So there's overloads all over the pitch. The only place he's not got an overload is the final third. But then they're doing the sides, they link up play around the corners, mm-hmm. the wee link up plays. We're so quick in that. And they go by and we're talking about we're talking about Callum. What, what about Matt Riley? What do you think of him? What? But he'd done something that there was a ball, somebody passed a ball to him in midfield and it was a bad pass, it was up around sort of waist tight. And he sort of took a touch with the inside of his foot, with his left foot up, and then he hooked it with the outside of his left foot over the it was still up there and he just hooked it. Over the head of the fullback for the, I think it was a bad that he ran in there. And you're just saying to yourself, well, that just shows you, he just knows, he's facing that way, but he just knows where it is. Yeah. And absolutely it's outstanding. And it? he's added goals right. to his game. Right. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, double figures this and season. And I, te- I know teams are sniffing about him and all the rumours and all that stuff. Uh, but he's come out and says he loves working with Brendan. So why not? I think he's a guy that still understands he's got a lot to learn. Still 22. Yeah, Still 22, and another couple of years at Celtic will do him no harm mm-hmm. once again. And you, when you're talking about professionalism and the standard through the week, Matt embodies that, I think, because you, yep. uh, you obviously have, having worked here and stuff, you'll have seen Matt, the way that Matt works at, uh, you know, at, at Lennox Town and stuff like that, away from even with the, the training pitch. He's a. I know. I know. These days you have to be the twenty-four hour athlete and stuff like that. Matt is the epitome of that. You know what he says? We're not going to talk about Celtic. Can't help uh, us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you were talking about Paul McStay, right? And I am not old enough to have watched Paul McStay live, and all I've had is footage of him. But when I see Cal McGregor now, the career he's had at Celtic, what he embodies for this club, it makes me think. Is Callum our version of Paul McStay? Because he's one of our own, aren't he? He's one of your own. He's, he's, that's what I'm saying. And there's nothing better when you get one coming right through the system, right through the academy, and go on to be the the footballer uh, it, 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 Callum's become. You know, unbelievable, really unbelievable. As I say, I, I jump about, I pal about with John Collins a lot, and um, we're always talking football. We're always in the golf club, moving things about, and he's here and he's there. And, he, he had the opportunity, obviously, being assistant manager here, to tell me how Callum went about his business. He says, and not just the way, the standard that he sets on the training pitch, what he demands of his teammates mm. and how this, the training goes. Now, there's no messing about, there's no laughing and joking. You know, you're always laughing and joking, but in the proper, in the way. And that's it, is what we talked about, is you, you train the way you play, Saturday comes easy. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think this season, Matt, we've been on here, we've, we've raved about certain players and one of the players that we have raved about throughout the season has been Liam Scales. And John, I'm interested from your point of view as a defender, what have you made of his was, progress? And I was on the radio on Saturday and I was just talking him up, where? saying he's been unbelievable, unbelievable. And the next again, minute, Celtic got turned over and the big boy, oh, yeah. b- big boy got played in on uh, the shoulder Peter, and yeah. he's chasing him. Peter Same got Welsh's played cousin, in. Yeah. I see his commentator, uh, <laughs> curse, curse, <laughs> aye. but absolutely fantastic. And that's doing to management as well. Yeah, you can easily go out there and you know and. Um, you can easily go out there and say, right, Celtic needs to go and sign a big name. And that's what the Celtic support want and expect. But sometimes, like myself, you know, I had to win them over. But sometimes the Celtic supporters know when you wear your heart on your sleeve and you get everything you've got, then 
they, they'll take to you. Mm-hmm. And they've certainly done that. He's been absolutely, and he's a good footballer. Yeah, but really he's, good. A, he's a lefty. Yeah, everybody thinks everybody, anybody in football. What does that matter? Trust me. I'm a right centre half. You play me left side centre half, and I'm like a fish up a tree. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, <laughs> I'm, yeah, it's like whoa, whoa, play right centre half, and I know my passing. I can hit the pass. Yeah. I can play my full back. I can clip it up the line. I can reverse it. Playing on the left hand side, you kind of do that. So it's so important to have that balance. And he's come on leaps and bounds and really, really I'm pleased for him. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're kind of going to round off just the section in Celtic I'll here. tell you another one, just before yeah, we yeah, go. Yeah, of course. Taylor, the fullback. Yeah. Magnificent. What an attitude that boy's got. Because many a time, everybody says, is he this, is he that, is he... And he's kept his head down and he just lets his football do the talking. And under uh, Ange, he moved into that midfield mm. role, you know, that inverted fullback. And he was very good on the ball. Um, never lets you down always available um, I was noticing a lot of teams when I see them they, they, they play they a high play ball he's on, good in there and he goes and competes uh-huh. and he takes a whack mm-hmm. and he get up and he goes on that's my kind of guy and he take nothing away from him he deserves everything he's getting because he showed over the years that he's been here he's real Celtic player yeah mm-hmm. see the amount of times that you see Greg where he's maybe picked up a niggle in a game you see him hobbling a little bit I, but at no point does he ever want to rest and come off the I park I happened on Saturday he had one yeah. of the socks yeah. down to the ankle yeah. sort of looking at the bench if they see I'm feeling the calf a wee bit I think Brendan just gave him the, <laughs> the old eye and on he goes and it never lets you down not, never not, lets not you down I mean to, to link Everton back you know as uh, here the Motherwell game earlier in the season at Fir Park, you know, the, the crazy game where... Oh, of course, yeah. Matt, Matt, Matt scores. About f- five minutes before that, the reason that game went so long <laughs> yeah. is because Greg Taylor got clattered. And, I mean, he's he's at, I thought he was lucky, actually, to be honest, to walk away from it because it's a, he's, a, he's got a straight leg and the guy comes in and, and it's mm. full weight. But that's why there was so much time uh, added you know, because of that, because Greg was injured, got but up and then sends the ball in for uh, Matt. For Matt uh, yeah, but yeah. Greg have played with uh, Brendan, the first time Brendan was here? No, it was uh, Neil Lennon signs. Was it Neil Lennon? Yeah, so yeah. That, 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 going back to Brendan, Brendan's come in, you know, and he's he's had a look. Most managers come in and they, what they want to do is they want to turn it over, want to get their own players in. Mm. And even when Brendan's come in and I'm saying, I think there might be one or two players coming in for Leicester and, you know, because he knows the market mm. and he knows what's going on and you're looking and he's saying, no, I'm coming in, I'm got to give all these players a chance, I'm got to see what they've got, get the best out of them. And even all the Japanese guys have come in, in here and they've went, in you go. That's a sign to a right good manager that he's got an overview looking and go, these guys know what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, these yeah. guys know what and no doubt with John John Kennedy and Woodge and all these guys there, they'll probably say, Brendan, listen, these guys won't let you do. Yeah. I seen see when I seen uh, Celtic against Livingston. Yeah. There was a rumour that uh, Maeda fell out of the physio after the game because he wanted to run him. <laughs> <laughs> he was doing to 10 men and he's doing the work of two guys. <laughs> that's, what, that's what my mate says. He said he fell out of the physio. He was wanting to run home. <laughs> Have you, did you um, come up against Brendan's teams when he was here before? Have you spent much time with them before? No, or? No, no. no, I know him. I know him. I've met him two or three times. Yeah. And uh, obviously... Uh, with Tommy Burns, Brendan was the uh, Brendan worked with Tommy doing yeah, it. Reading, yeah. Reading. Um, so it just shows you and all that. But great. F- Listen, I keep talking and all that. There's there's football clubs with philosophy, and the ph- philosophy and the Celtic supporters are educated right for a way back. You have to play real good passing football and keep the ball and good ball retention and, you know, open teams up and all that stuff. That's how you have to have a special manager that's got that philosophy. You cannot bring a man. Everybody at their own. I'm no knocking. Everybody at their own, you know, everybody. Uh, But you cannot bring in, or you have to be careful if you do bring in a manager that are just a little bit different. Because if you do, you're not getting success. It's not going to work. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's move on, John and Matt. Um, what we're going to do is, in the second part, we're going to talk about your actual Celtic playing career. So what we'll actually do is we'll kind of talk about your, your playing career before that when we get to that part in, in part two. I want to talk a little bit more about your, your management because we've spoken a little bit about it there, about Inverness and Falkirk and, and getting to the cup finals as well. And, you know, my memory of when I first getting into football that Falkirk team that you first managed 
was in the league for a good good five seasons or so and when you were in charge um, obviously you I think won the first division in the, the first year you were there but then couldn't have come up because of the whole issue with Broadville yeah, which yeah. is um, I think it was Murrowville that stood up what, I'll tell you exactly what happened I went back Ian McCall was a manager and Ian McCall we used to play at Falkirk together when Jim Jeffries and Billy Brown were the manager yeah. great days at Broadville I'll say this honest enough to say this that was the best dressing room I've been in for mm -hmm. uh, camaraderie and team spirit and some of the characters that were in that dressing room some of the stuff that <laughs> went on it was oh, <laughs> unbelievable absolutely but it was an environment that Jim and Bully created that you were looking forward to go to your work um, and Brockville wasn't the best so any time you know that old stadium do you remember Brockville yeah, when you were yeah. too young I just remember it yeah the goalkeeper could kick it for box to box and you know it was it was great so it was absolutely fantastic but anyway I played with Ian Ian got a job at uh, Falkirk I was down at Air United they asked me to come back I went back I was 38 at the time still fit still playing away <laughs> I could still sort of Brockville suited me it wasn't a big pitch then Ian got the job at Dundee United and went so Owen Coyle was at the club at the time. He was scoring all the goals. I was at the back trying to organise the defence. And he just says, listen, we don't want to use to just take it over. So me and Owen, the team picked itself because we were winning every week. All we done was bring Brian Rice in that I knew from Falkirk and Owen knew from Airdrie. And we brought him in just to look after the bench because me and Owen played. And that was it. At the end of the season, we won the league. And then Owen went to Dundee United with Ian McCall. Yeah. So I'm saying, am I getting a job or no? Um, it was up in the air and everything was going on. Are we going to get promoted to the SPL through the stadium criteria? Unfortunately, it never happened. I think it was Murrowell that stayed up. Yeah. It was Murrowell that stayed up. So we had to play our football back in the first division. I got the job. So you're saying, right, OK, right. And this was it flung right into the deep end but I was always sort of prepared for it because I'd done my coaching badges when I was at I'd done my B badge when I was about 26 you know a few of us with Falkirk were doing so I was always interested in coaching and all that stuff and always a captain in most clubs that I played for so you know led for the front that kind of sort of come on it's not too hard come on let's get going so so but then when you get flung into the deep end you're right in there and then you're not getting that promotion and then the budget that you thought it wasn't there, you've played with these guys for the year, you're playing your football, we ended up playing our football at Stenhouse Muir mm. to keep it in the community. Mm. On the Astro Turf, you've not got an office, you've, you've not got a stadium. <laughs> you know, it's jumpers for goalposts, you're saying <laughs> to yourself, wow, what a pa baptism this is. And then you're sort of saying, you've played with these guys and you're saying, listen, I'm sorry, I've not got any money. The budget's not what we thought it was, I've not got the money, and you're ducking and diving and wheeling and dealing. Uh, so that first year uh, obviously playing in the first division I think we finished fourth uh, but it gave, gave you a taste for it and then the next year it was the stadium he says right we're building the stadium and then I put a team together uh, um, by Christmas time we were guaranteed to win it the next again year but the criteria still wasn't made and a good guy a boy um, <coughs> Bolt says, right, I'll finance a stand at the back of the Sandy Alexander, a, a Falkirk supporter. And he built a stand at the back of one of the goals. Uh, we met the criteria and then we stayed up and that was us. We got a promotion, yeah. stayed up. I signed Russell Latipi. What he a was, player. He was a catalyst for everything that we'd done at the club. Everything that we'd done at the club. He was. He didn't know it at the time. You know, we, we, um, in terms of <laughs> bringing young kids through you would put him in the young kids team. You would play the young kids against them. And once the young kids sort of says, uh, I can handle Latapi or get that, I'm in the same, I'm playing in the same team as Latapi. I'm talking about guys like Arfield and Scobies and these guys just grew. You could see them grow so much. So we had six kids in the Scotland under 21 team when I was at Falkirk. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. Got to the Scottish Cup final, two League Cup semi finals, and kept them in the SPL yep. for five years. That was there. I then left to go to Hibs, and it's yeah, it yeah. nosedive see, since then. See, just to take you. Is that blowing my own trumpet? <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to. Aye, ah, exactly. <laughs> he does it all the time, though. Um, <laughs> see, just to go back a step there, see when you, when you sign uh, Latipe, 
do you envisage that that's the impact that he'll have on the club as a whole? You flung a, a, a wee spanner in the works late last night, you see, oh, by the way, mm-hmm. pick your best Celtic a living that you played with, managed or managed against. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gave me a wee bit of leeway yeah. there. Obviously, Celtic, if there was a player I could pick, it's never been involved with Celtic, if we get a game in that team, it'd be Russell Latipi. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, the Canio and all these guys, and we're talking about Paul McStay, Latipi was technically probably up there. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Honestly, no people say, oh, how can he say that? Look, he played for folk and all that stuff. I get all that. There must have been something in his makeup that stopped him going right to the top. But don't forget, Latapu played for, played for Porto. Porto against oh. Sampdoria, European right. Cup semi final. Yeah. It was Latapu and Emerson in the midfield. Latapu running the show. Yeah. And that Sampdoria team was. The, the proper something do uh, they've got with. to cut final you've been cut right, final right. yeah. you know uh, what I, the reason I'm saying that I've seen him doing things I've seen him catch a ball once on his chest pat on the back he said roll it down back he looked on a training pitch my chairman at the time was looking and, and I'm standing saying I see that every day I see <laughs> used to not make me when I played with him at Hibs yeah. every day come that way come back that way left foot right foot is, you wouldn't know what one and I've seen a thing um Dwight York talking about his best all-time Manchester United players mm-hmm. and he says the same if there was another one that could put in it he, would have, yeah. he was a genius he was a Aye. nightmare to manage but not in a bad way he, he, he was like a, a, a decanio kind of guy everything he'd done was for the greater good of the, the team Aye. and all that stuff but Russell any chance of not taking the boys on a Saturday night because <laughs> we had a lot of Portuguese guys and Russell helped to bring them all over Russell any chance and then you would say right come on boys like, Russell Russell and all the boys and you're in the toilet having a fag <laughs> before the game I can remember we come out here and we played once Don't and teach that your Celtic coaching got a corner and it come out uh-huh. and Russell had it on the edge of the box and he got fourth and it was big Bobo Baldi chasing him, right. around him and Russell was doing all this and he's turning and dipping the shooter, Big Bobo, honestly, Big Bobo just went off and just ran away. <laughs> and left him, just went, I'm not going near that. And just, he was a genius, a nah. genius of a footballer. Well, it was, it Let's was, say a flawed genius. Yeah, nah. <laughs> it was some Falkirk team during that time that you were there. I remember a time you beat us here at uh, Celtic Park in the, the League Cup, I think it was, in penalties. Mm-hmm. Um, we had some brilliant players, you mentioned some of them there. You know, guys we know here let's, in terms of Stokes let's as tell well. tell you the story because we're going yeah, to talk go for about it. Uh, the gaffer Tommy Burns yeah. who, who, who I know had a real profound effect on me but I'll tell the story now that we're at this Gordon Stratton was the manager of Celtic at the time yep. and I like to wear white and white so we sort of say to Celtic we're wearing white socks so when Celtic turned up we changed for no one so it kicked off a wee bit I was keeping out uh, uh, Chipper Brian Rice was in it so him and Gordon had a wee tiff tat anyway I don't know how we finished one all. so after the game I was in, and then I went to do my press. So when I come back in, this is the quality of the man he told me burn. So when I come back in, you would imagine when the stadium got back, got built, it wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't right. The office is the last thing, so it was the smallest office. You, and the the desk was right against the wall with my chair, and it was probably two wee sofas that you could get your guests on, you know. So it was. And then, so I just come in thinking, right, okay, I better watch what I'm doing. Come in here, who's sitting? Behind my desk, <laughs> with his feet up on the desk, on the seat, the gaffer Tommy Burns. <laughs> All right, Yog. <laughs> the rest of the atmosphere was a wee bit old, you know, because Gordon was raging. We got a draw and all the carry on and all that, so it wasn't. So they didn't stay too long. And he's just sitting back, you know, the gaffer <laughs> sitting back, and he had that in him, you know, just sitting back and here, just listening and laughing. Right, time to go. So they all leave. And we were very good that day. We were really good. So, right, they all leave. So we're saying, and, uh, what do you think? Aye, aye. This is saying, a minute later, bang on the door. Door opens, pops in. He says, by the way, and he's looking about, he's a different class. Keep that style of football up. That's the kind of guy. Brilliant. Different class. Fantastic. That's, that. you know, gracious in, in defeat. It just aye, shows you the, it was the a character. Draw, but it but just shows you, aye. We'll have a real was, chat about Tommy and the, when we have a Celtic section. Aye, we'll go right into it. Yeah, right. definitely. Brilliant. <laughs> and then, um, 
we've touched a bit on a Falkirk there. Yeah, as I was saying, it was a really good team. Even some of the lone players you had. Remember Casper Schmeichel and Tim Kill. Well, I, I, our recruitment was great, Casper Schmeichel. And I, I was saying that, I see Joe Hart save on Saturday, where it's a big one. Ah, it's I first seen that yeah. with Casper, that must have come off his old man. Uh, so Casper come up, done brilliant. And then Tim Cruel after that, as I say, Arfield, Scobie all went on to have a great career. Five kids. And out of all that time, um, I think... We never, never once went out of budget. In all my time in football, I've spent 250 grand. <laughs> and 130 grand of that was on Stokesy when I signed on from Sunderland to Hibs when I was manager yeah. of Hibs. Yeah. That was, that was the, the other okay ones, player. the other three players is Dean Holden, um, signed him from Peterborough, 30 grand. Alan Gill. Tribunal from Airdrie, 50 grand, and John Stewart, I think it was 30, 40 grand, John Stewart from yeah. Aberdeen. So, we were ducking, ducking and diving. <laughs> but we were, we were constantly, that's one thing Jim Jeffries and Billy Brown, uh, every Tuesday they would be in the car and they were away down south. And if you look at the players that come at Falkirk, when I played at the time at Brockville, you're talking about like Kevin McAllister, a legend at Falkirk, Chelsea, crunchy, mm-hmm. Chelsea, Joe McLaughlin. There was, going to, there was rumour it was got to come to Celtic went down to Chelsea. Chelsea captain. Simon Stainrod. Tommy McQueen. You're talking about Tommy McQueen left back for West Ham. Brian Rice, Notts Forest. Yeah. You, and you're talking about then um, at Morris Johnston when you move on Simon Stainrod. Simon Stainrod was going to sing for Barcelona when <laughs> Terry Venables had worked with him at Q, uh, Queen's Park Rangers. Terry Venables. Simon Stainrod, I think he got capped uh, might have got cap for England, Simon. What do, uh, these? So, what I'm trying to say is, we seen all the and Jim Jeffries and Billy Brown were constantly doing self looking at players. So when we got the job, and me and uh, Chipper were in it, we were constantly, constantly doing self every Tuesday. We thought that was enormous. Yeah. That's what everybody had done. So much so we were doing at Manchester United that much. We were basically in the dressing room with Ricky Sparese and uh, Brian McClare because we were doing, we got to know uh, them that yeah. much, watching them all, watching them all. And that's how you get them because these guys know you're doing their doing your work. It's no a woman, a player, uh-huh. phoning them up any chance, any chance. But you're doing their doing your work. And that's where Casper come up. Yeah. I can remember it. We were doing watching it and all the scouts leave. All the scouts leave to go away. And Chipper says, Right, come on, we better get down the road, get three hour drive back up the road. And says, No. Because we were doing that and we had something like about 800 quid in our pocket because we used to run the budget. And he says, no, he says, what do you mean? I says, eh, you played with Pierce, Stuart Pierce in Forest, eh? He says, aye. I says, you're going in after the game. And <laughs> you're going, chip right enough, chip on, hold his brass bang on the door. Oh, how you doing, Brian? Aye, aye. He says, well, I'll let you know in the morning's morning. He says, we've only got 800 quid. Money's no problem. He needs to play football. Yeah. And all credit to Casper. Casper like right, next to game morning and he was up there. Boom. Deal done. That's yeah. fascinating isn't it? that that's I know. The, the work that goes on is <laughs> absolutely fantastic. I and then another one, we uh we, we we got a few players from Arsenal through Liam Brady. Right. Anthony and Stokes. The, well the first one is a wee boy, wee midfielder, wee Irish midfielder called Patrick Craig. Right. We Craig and his sidekick was O'Donnell, Stephen O'Donnell, and they come, they come like as a two ball. Um, two Irish boys. I think the two of them are managing now over in Ireland. Mm. I think they are, I they will be. Anyway, long story. So we got they two, and then we played Celtic here, and we beat them in the cup. League Cup, we beat them on yeah, penalties. penalties yeah. And Liam Brady was at the game, and after the game, Liam Brady come down and says, the style of football, give me a phone, I've got one or two others for you. And we got another one, we got a one called uh, Graham Barrett, who was probably potentially the best out of them all, but had a knee problem. Mm-hmm. His knee got knocked out, and we had to sort of rehab him, but he, he was, you could tell. And then Stokes had come along, Boy Bradley come along, Mark Howard, the goalkeeper, so we, just because of the style of football and the way we looked after them, we uh, Liam sort of says, "Listen, right, that's it." And the boys, obviously, the boys were talking say, proper football. Yeah, it's yeah, proper football. Yeah, uh, I just want to touch on a few more of the the players that you you worked with at your, your other clubs as well that have connections here at Celtic Park. Maybe some of the fans might want to hear some stories about. And of course, after your time at Falkirk, you you moved to Hibs again. Finished fourth that season, playing some great football, and you had two guys up front and Derek Rardin and Anthony Stokes, uh-huh. who graced Celtic Park as well. <laughs> I mean, 
Two great strikers to have up front. You've scored barrel loads of goals, but I imagine it must have been a difficult to, to deal with as a manager as well. No, easy. <laughs> Stokes, Stokes was a handful. Yeah. Uh, you have to keep your eye on Stokes. Uh, Derek was easy. Yeah. Derek was easy. You just Derek never gave me a one bit of problem. Uh, don't forget, when I was a player there, Derek was a kid. Yeah, of course. So when I was there and the captain of the club, uh, there's a great story. With the, the kids used to, all the, all the apprentices used to clean the boots in the boot room. And she's just fly in, turn the light off, and it was a free for all. <laughs> and everybody, everybody's in there, O'Connor, O'Connor, Ryan, yeah. and all these guys. And then, and as the weeks went by, all the kids would say, oh, "Come on, then get your." And I went, "Oh, but what you're doing, you're building up a, a real spirit amongst them because then you would go and watch them play and say, listen, you you need to get stuck in.' You know what I mean? You're playing for Hibs, and you, you a small part of it, you were sort of trying to help them along there, but Derek was never ever a problem uh, for me. What a fantastic footballer. Wasn't the hardest working guy in the world. Uh, didn't want to cheat. I used to see Derek, I'll give you a Monday, Monday off if I see you running 30 yards, slight tackling and coming away with the ball. Is he serious? I says, you do that for me, I'll give you, I'll, <laughs> I'll always give you Monday off. But you built your team around. Yeah. Mm what Derek couldn't do because you, you knew he was a great out of possession so you made sure that you played a system that if we got a turnover you could get it Derek you get it Derek or Stokes in that matter in the top half of the pitch nine times out of ten it was mm. in the back of the net Stokes had Derek and Big Nishy I think Big yeah, Nishy yeah, chipped in with 12 they scored 52 goals Oof. between them the next again year uh, Hibs I don't think the whole team scored 52 goals yeah that was incredible. Wow. I, I, do you know what you see with Derek Riordan? I remember when he signed, it was 2006, and I was so excited about him signing. And I was really, really gutted that it never properly really worked mm. for him here because, you know, John, the talent he had, left foot and right foot, yeah. free kicks, like one of the best strikers of a ball you probably saw mm. in Scotland during that time. I was really gutted it didn't work out fully It's funny for him that, here. and you're talking to two of probably the two of them, you know, the fr- from uh, Stokes, the, you know, the... The hard work in housing estates, mm. you know, the schemes. Yeah. You know, Derek, I think Derek's from Moorhouse, uh, through in Edinburgh. And then Stokesy, obviously, you know, and it just shows you the desire and the hunger. You know, playing football in the street, you know, you don't see that. Playing it and you're sort of saying, how do you learn all that? Um, you know, and playing football in the street. And that's what it was even, you know, these guys. But to get the two of them, and at that time, you're saying, you're saying wow. <laughs> I think Stokesy scored 20, 22 goals that year. Yeah, 22 he goals. I think the following season, yeah, the following season, and the thing about it was, it was always going to Celtic. I knew the, and it just shows you how football works. I knew it was on the cards, it was on the table. My disappointment, it got done the, the last day of the window. So yeah. when Stokes went out, that was me. I had nothing <coughs> at Hibs. I was, it should have been done. So it gave me a chance. Yeah. We had a trial list in at Hibs at the time. He says, well. We, we, we took a chance on the trialist, um, and that was a little bit disappointing. But another one, I don't know what it is with Derek or Stokesy or their character, my character. I take to these guys. <laughs> yeah. These guys, a, these guys that have got a wee bit of rogue about them. That you sort of say to yourself, I've been there, I understand it. We see what you're talking about that kind of the, the upbringing of football, you know. It, they take it serious because it's that they've come up a kind of harder pathway. Do you, think that you know you've got an argument in that, you know that. What you've said is you've got an argument in that because everybody will say, because you've told us, when we all play about football in the street till mm-hmm. the lights went out, couldn't you went to a ball in the morning, mm-hmm. you're, you're saying, um, and you learn. we played, I played for, you would, the only reason you would join a boys brigade because you've got to give me football. Uh-huh. So you join a boys brigade, um, you would play for your school side in the morning, you would play for your club team. Uh, even in the afternoon or the next again day and it was all that and it was constantly football nowadays if you're doing that they're saying oh they're playing too much football yeah. you protect them and I get it oh, I get everybody's argument but never done us any good uh, 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 never done us any bad you know it was absolutely fantastic I'm sitting here talking about my career and talking about and we're coming on to the Celtic and my, and my management I'm going to tell you something right now I would give the whole lot up everything up to start again as a, as a 10 year old kid I loved every minute of it, every <laughs> single minute. The hard times, the injuries, the bad times, getting beat, picking yourself up, the disappointments, no making a grade, proving people wrong. I loved every minute of it. And being in that dressing room where you were in an environment where you could be yourself, the laughs and the carry on <laughs> and, the, and the jokes and 
Well, Amazing. obviously the Morris Johnston won at Falkirk where the street kit Morris yes, Johnston won it. Quite famous for that. I, I don't <laughs> don't think you could get away. And that's some of the stuff that and if you look at that, everybody, will be, if you look very, very closely, I, I've done that. Do you look closely? I, I've done that. Hey, 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 go back, go back, go hey, back. Hey, well, listen. There he goes. Uh, listen. Uh, one other player, John, uh, before we wrap up this section of part one and then we get into the Celtic stuff that I wanted to ask about, we, we mentioned about Inverness and uh, your time there, but Ryan Christie, oh. who you had there, obviously comes to us <coughs> after that, goes on loan to Aberdeen, then really kicks on with Celtic. He's now playing, I think, centre defensive mid at Bournemouth and ripping it up in the Premier yeah. League. How good was he at that age? And did you always know he was going to he was going to The do story that? about Ryan Christie, well, I always knew Charlie. Charlie, yeah. the old man was up there. Charlie and the mother uh, and his mum's got everything to... They're the ones that brought him up. But the reason I say that before I got in the football says you, you couldn't have come up against a better... Uh, human being, absolutely fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I'll just give you a wee caveat to that. When I took him into the first team, he still changed with his mates, all his kids that he, she all the apprentices, didn't want to move into the first team peg. That just humble, humble yeah. boy. So the story goes, well, I went up to Inverness, never knew anything about Ryan Christie, but I wanted to see what was in the kids. I got lucky because when I was at Celtic, there was a boy at... Uh, was an apprentice here called Scott Kelleher. Um, and Big Pots that went to Hibs and mm -hmm. all, all yeah, these guys yeah. were all the kids. Uh, Paul Douglas and all these guys, they yeah. were all the kids when I was here. And I got to know Kells well. So when I went up to Inverness, I already knew Kells. And then I sort of, Kells took the kids and I just said, right, so right. So stand back, as I say, overview, see what needs done. And I says to Kells, go and train the kids in the afternoon to come and see. He said, I think I've got one or two that might do you. I said, we'll train them in the afternoon. <laughs> two minutes, I just went, oh, he's with the first team. Honestly, if you're a football guy, you know your stuff, you just, you know, you're sitting watching games and I can watch and there's nothing going on in the game and all of a sudden mm -hmm. you're talking, you're saying, he's never been watching a game, you're meant to be scouting it. All of a sudden, somebody just goes, boom, 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 boom. And you go, oh, who's that? Yeah. They just do something different. Ryan Christie was nutmegging people and I just oh he was the first team he was the first team he trained with the first team that week next again week he was in the first team never come out of it had mm. to protect him a little bit um, Collins John was here I says John I've got a star I've got a star John says right okay um, I says you need, you need to get a look at him you need to get a look at him and then I says just let him progress right we'll keep our eye on him keep me posted if anybody else comes in for him Always kept Charlie and sort of Ryan updated and listen, Celtic, Celtic, Celtic. And I can remember, I don't know if I can say this really, we come to Celtic Park and Celtic, it was coming at the time it was really heavy on it, Celtic were after him. And I says to Ryan, I picked the team, I said, Ryan, I'm not going to start you. And he was gutted. I said, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do with you, no matter what the score is, you're going on at half time. And I want you to go in there and put on an exhibition and a performance that Celtic cannot say no. I don't know if we could have done it for 90 minutes when you're chasing a game mm. and your back's against the walls. So I was probably done a wee bit of it, as I say, a manager sort of doing him a turn there. Mm -hmm. He come on at half time, I think the score finished 4-2, I think we scored He's, two goals. Yeah, Ryan I, scored. I, I think Ryan scored. He did, yeah. He come on and come in after and I went in to see Ronnie after the game and John and John says, I says, Ronnie, you've seen it for yourself and I think the next day game week the deal was done but one of these guys as a coach and as a manager you're wanting the best for them because of the way he conducted himself and the way he trained you, and listen I've talked about the guys that I had up at uh, Inverness and guys like Richie Foran as well Yeah, never really played he was injured all the time but run the dressing room real good and uh, so when Ryan come in and went on the first team training pitch and the chain, my training changed it was all small sided you know uh, possession giving goals and all that where Never gave him a free kick, never or, or, or games. Guys were play on, play on, and he just got up and go play on, play on. But all you're doing is toughing them up, toughing them up, up, and yeah, you yeah. just you just used to start laughing, and got used to it. But the players looked after him. The players looked after him, and they knew they had a star in the team. And you can, I take great pride in yeah. even now seeing him playing yeah. doing an English Premiership. What a career. What a career. John, we are going to take a little break now. I think we've we've covered a lot there and. We're going to end, say, say goodbye to, to part one. Um, if you're watching us, listening to this, 
next week part two is going to come out which we're about to get into we're going to talk all about your Celtic playing career and we're going to get that one to live in so that's definitely one you do not want to miss um, but if you're listening then make sure you're subscribing to the official Celtic FC podcast so you don't miss this episode next week we're going to take a little break and we'll be back very very shortly